Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, the International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speaker is Rocio Titiunik from the University of Michigan. Her talk's entitled, New Developments in the Analysis and Interpretation of Regression Discontinuity Designs and Their Application to Political Science. Rocio's talk will last between uh, 30 to 40 minutes, after which point we will take questions from uh, the audience. You may call in to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call in line, which is 1-855-982-9766, or you can email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. For our viewers outside the United States, we recommend you use the, uh, that you use the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions immediately. A copy of the slideshow that goes along with this presentation is available in the Handouts box in your GoToWebinar window. And now I'd like to welcome Rocio Tutunik to the International Methods Colloquium. Welcome. Thank you, Justin. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in my office and everywhere else around the world. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of uh, my research uh, uh, with co-authors on regression discontinuity design, estimation, and inference. In particular, today I'm going to talk uh, about in uh, inference and some of uh, uh, the issues that arise when we want to estimate RD effects and how that uh, can be applied to political science problems. So before I, um, before I go into the details of what I'm going to be talking about, I want to place the RD design uh, in context for you. So um, in the last decades, we really view this design as part of the causal inference framework. Uh, and in this framework, the goal is to learn about uh, a treatment, the effect of a treatment or a policy uh, or an intervention uh, on an outcome of interest. Right, and so that's that's the goal. If the treatment for which we're trying to learn the effect is randomly assigned, then it's we know it's relatively easy to estimate the effect of the treatment. But if the tre if treatment randomization is not available, if the treatment has not been randomly assigned, um, inference is is hard. And the reason, main reason why it's hard. Uh, is that when the treatment is not randomly assigned, we typically ignore the way in which the treatment was assigned, and and this unknown feature of the random of the of the treatment assignment mechanism makes it very hard to make inferences. And so we broadly say we call observational studies all studies where the assignment of the treatment is not under the control of the researcher, and we know little about how the treatment was assigned. So RD design. The, design, the regression continuity design belongs to uh, observation, you know, but to the category of observational studies, and among observational studies is one of the most credible. And the reason is uh, because in an RD design, we that we know a lot about how the treatment is assigned, about the mechanism that assigns this treat, and even though we're not in control of this assignment, uh, the how the treatment is assigned depends on. Uh, known features of the world, external factors that are verifiable. And so we have an objective basis to evaluate the assumptions that we need to invoke to use this design. Uh, and so this makes it uh, much more credible than other types of observational studies. So it explains perhaps why it's become uh, a popular design. Um, so the, the design is defined by a triplet. So we have units that participate in the study, and uh, the triplet is uh, a score, a cutoff, and a treatment. So the units in the study receive a score, which we're going to call X, and a treatment is assigned based on whether the score exceeds or, or not a known cutoff, which we're going to call X0. So the treatment is given according to a very particular rule. So it, every unit whose score is above the cutoff receives the treatment, Every unit whose score is below the cutoff is assigned to the control condition. And throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that there are no compliance problems, so that everyone whose score is above the cutoff receives the treatment and takes it, and then below the cutoff is the control. So this is also called the sharp RD design. OK, so what I want to do in yeah the remaining 30 minutes that we have um, 
is to talk about how to make it what first what are the identification assumptions that we need um, and and then talk about how we estimate RD treatment effects and how we make inferences and here we're uh, I'm going to talk about some recent developments uh, that I've contributed to in in how to conduct inferences that are robust um, uh, in in a very particular sense that I'm going to explain and then I'm going to show you an example I want to clarify that throughout the talk I'm going to be using what I call the continuity based uh, framework for RD design so uh, I am not going to be um, understanding this design as a local experiment around a cutoff uh, that's kind of an alternative uh, interpretation I've worked on that in other projects but in this talk I'm going to stick to the interpretation of are the based on continuity not 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 uh, local local experiments okay so I'm going to give you the notation very basic notation uh, so that we can use it in the in the in the rest of the talk. So we're going to assume that in this study we have n units indexed by i, so one, two, through n, and every one of these units in our study receives a score. Uh, and the treatment di is is this indicator function, which uh, is one when the score that the unit receives is above the cutoff and is zero otherwise. Right, so that's how we formally write it with the with the indicator function. And I'm going to adopt the potential outcomes framework. As I said in the beginning, um, m most of the work uh, in RD methodology has been in uh, in this framework, and so th this uh, our project is also part of this framework. And so what we're going to um, assume, th uh, think about, is that every unit has two potential outcomes: one potential outcome under treatment, and one potential outcome under control. So uh, every unit uh, would display Y1 if the unit received the treatment and would display an outcome equal to Y0 if it received control and if you, the individual treatment effect uh, is the difference between these two potential outcomes. Obviously for every, the fundamental problem of causal inference is that for every one of these units we only observe one of the two potential outcomes. So if your score is below the cutoff, I only observe Y0, which is here the potential outcome under control. If your score is above the cutoff, I only observe potential outcome under treatment. So I I only observe one of the two potential outcomes. And so this is the standard fun problem of causal inference that uh, in the context of the RD design. So I want to show you graphically uh, this problem in, in, in the parameter of interest. So what I'm showing here is a plot. Uh, on the x-axis we have the score that determines treatment assignment uh, in the RD design and the y-axis I have the expectation of the potential outcome given the score. So this is also called the regression, the regression function, the regression of y on x. So what this is is the expectation of the, the expected potential outcome seen as a function of the score. Um, in x0, you have the cut of that vertical line over there, and so we have two regression functions. The top function, which is in red, is the uh, expected potential outcome of, give, of the potential outcome uh, under treatment, and that's the top red line. The, top, the bottom blue line is the expected potential outcome under control for all values of the score. Um, the average treatment effect at any value of the score is the difference between the vertical distance between these two be, between these two functions, between these two curves. So if you take for example uh, 50, well the average treatment effect at 50 is the expected potential outcome under treatment at 50 minus the expected potential outcome under control at 50. So at every point along these curves, uh, the vertical distance between the two give us the average, uh, gives us the average treatment effect uh, at that particular value of the score. Now, the fundamental problem of causal inference that occurs at the individual level translates into a fundamental problem of causal inference at the average level because if you, if you see, so what happens here is that the top red uh, line is only observed uh, 
for values of the score that are above the cutoff. So above the cutoff, everyone is treated. So we don't get to observe the potential outcome under control. So the blue line is dotted, it's not observed. Below the cutoff, the top, the top curve is not observed. Uh, only the lower one is, the blue one. And so what happens is that at every point along the value of the score, we either observe one of the functions but not the other, and so we cannot calculate the average treatment effect anywhere. That's, that's the problem. Um, there is a very special point, however, which is the cutoff, which is at zero, at which we can almost, under some assumptions, we can actually recover that vertical distance, which is the RD treatment effect. So in the figure, you see that I have called that vertical distance at the cutoff the average treatment effect, and I have the definition of that effect at the top. Uh, above the graph, that's the expected value, that the average difference between potential outcome under treatment and under control at the cutoff. That's, that's the effect that we're after, and the reason is that that is x0, the cutoff, is the point at which we can recover the vertical distance between those two curves. And what we're going to need, what the assumption that we're going to need to recover this is to assume, so imagine that you are exactly at x0, so units that have a value of the score that is equal to x0 plus epsilon, plus a little more, all those units receive the treatment. Units that have, that are very, have a score very close to x0, but are below it, so they have a score equal to x0 minus epsilon, all those units receive control. Um, but they're very close to one another. Once our a group of units, is, the group of units who is barely above x0 plus epsilon is very close to the units that are barely below and have score x0 minus epsilon. And so if we make the assumption that the average potential outcomes epsilon away from the cutoff behave very similarly to how they would be, they behave exactly at the cutoff, then what we can, what we can do is that's this called a continuity assumption. We can rely on this continuity assumption to say, okay, then we can compare units that are barely above the cutoff to units that are barely below, and the only difference between them under continuity is going to be that the units above receive the treatment, the units below, below receive the control, and so I can take the difference between the outcomes, observed outcomes right above and right below, and recover the average treatment effect at the cutoff. So that's that's the main identification result of RD, and so in this in the equation at the above the graph, what you see here is that um, the definition of the of the average treatment effect is unobservable. So the as we define it, it's unobservable. So the expected y1 minus y0 at the cutoff that's an unobservable quantity because of the fundamental problem of causal inference. But given continuity of these regression functions at the cutoff, we can recover that as a difference of two limits, limit from above and from below of the observed outcomes. Uh, and those limits are now observable, so are estimable. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the main intuition behind, you know, the identification result. And so what we need is for this blue and, and red lines to be continuous at the cutoff so that we can approximate that vertical distance. Okay, so that's the estimation result, um, the identification result. Estimation relies on this idea. So what estimation has to do is basically estimate those two limits that you see on the right-hand side of that equation using your data. Um, what this requires is approximating the regression function that you see here from above and from and from below at the cutoff. Mm, obviously, one of the main um, benefits or um, attractive features of the design is that the only thing that we need to assume, or you know, uh, other regularity conditions, but the, the the most important assumption that we need to make is continuity of the regression functions at the cutoff to recover the average treatment effect at the cutoff, we really don't need to know the functional form of this function, right? So we don't need to know exactly how this function uh, is, looks, away from the cutoff. All we need to assume is that these two functions are continuous. We don't want to make assumptions about the specific form that this function takes. We don't want to say it's exactly linear or it's cubic or it's uh, the quadratic, we don't know. Uh, the Typically, we're, we're going to have an outcome and a score, 
and the relationship between the two is going to be unknown to us, complicated, and so we don't want to commit to a parametric uh, model, and we don't have to, to recover the effect. And so estimation um, typically proceeds, you know, follows this idea, the idea that, that we don't really need to know what the function of form is to get a point estimator, and so it typically, the standard way has become to use non-parametric methods precisely to avoid this parametric, uh, this functional form assumptions. And so uh, the standard uh, approach is now to use local polynomial estimation. That's what I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about how to do lo uh, um, local polynomial estimation uh, and then how to make inferences based on, on local polynomial. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how obtaining a point estimator is a very different task from uh, making inferences. So local polynomial estimation requires three ingredients. Um, we first need we need to choose the uh, order of the polynomial, and then we need to choose a bandwidth within which uh, we're going to keep observations and we're going to discard observations outside. And then within this bandwidth, we're going to weight observations in a particular way. So I don't want to I want to show you this graphically because I think it's going to be more clear. Um, so I'm showing you again this graph that shows the regression function, so the expected potential outcomes under treatment and under control as a function of the score. Um, and what we have here is um, the RD treatment effect is the difference between these two lines at the cutoff, so it's alpha 1 minus alpha 0, that's the true effect. And so we're now going to imagine that we get uh, data, data points, my blue points look a little strange in this computer, but that's okay. Um, so we have treated observations, those are the red dots, and we have control observations, and so that's the information that we receive, the data set that we get when we are going to do the study. We download it, uh, get it, somehow this is our data, and so this is how reality is. We really don't know what are the underlying uh, true functions that generate th this data. The only thing that we get is our data points. So what, how does local estimation proceed? Well, uh, we, I'm going to assume now that we choose, we're going to choose an order of polynomial equal to 1. I'm going to explain a little bit uh, later exactly uh, why, why we would want to choose uh, this low order of polynomial. But for now, let's assume we're going to do a local linear estimation. And so the, what we're going to do is, given that we've chosen to do local linear estimation, we're going we're gonna, to uh, choose a bandwidth. I'm going to talk about how to choose it later. We're going to choose a bandwidth, and uh, what a bandwidth is 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 a neighborhood, a band around the score, uh, around the cutoff, such that we're going to discard all the observations that are outside of it. Within that bandwidth, what we're going to do is we chose uh, in this example we're going to do local linear, so we're going to do a, a polynomial of order one. We're going to fit a polynomial of order one to the right. We're going to fit another polynomial of order one to the left. We're going to fit them separately, and then we're going to take the intercept from each of these two least squares regressions, uh, and we're going to take the difference between these two intercepts, and that's going to be our estimate, our point estimate of the RD effect. And then we are going to hope, uh, and we're going to, we're, we can, one can show that this estimator actually has good properties, uh, but the hope is then that the difference between the estimated alpha 1 and alpha 0, alpha 1 hat and alpha 0 hat, is close to the true jump to the true difference in the true regression functions. So that's what local uh, polynomial estimation is. Um, you can see then that the idea behind choosing the order of a polynomial, the idea be behind this approach is not that we, ch we choose, a, uh, we think that the function is of a particular polynomial order. We don't believe that the function is linear or that the function is quadratic. What we do is we use a polynomial as an approximation. We know any function can be approximated by a polynomial function. So we use it just as an approximation to unknown regression functions. So the point here is that the blue and the red lines are never available to us, and we choose this method, which is non-parametric, to just approximate these functions with a, with a polynomial. So. So how do we go from here to estimation is what I want to discuss uh, now. So the way in which these choices, you know, you can, you can see there are a lot of choices. 
Uh, so we need to choose the order of the polynomial, we need to choose the bandwidth, we also choose typically a kernel function which weighs the observations within the bandwidth to give more weight to observations that are close. Um, so the order in which we make these choices is the following. So the first thing we do is we, we choose a, a, a polynomial order first um, and a kernel function. Um, given the order of, a, of the polynomial that we've chosen, then we choose a bandwidth. And this bandwidth is typically chosen to be optimal in some way, uh, either, me, either mean square error optimal or coverage error rate optimal. Uh, mo most underway is mean square error optimal. And then once we have that bandwidth, we construct the point estimator. And because we chose our bandwidth optimally, we chose the bandwidth that makes our point estimator optimal, then that point estimator has optimal properties. Uh, then the first three steps are clear in the sense that we, c given the order of the polynomial, we can choose a bandwidth that leads, leads uh, to a, a point estimator that has optimal properties. The, the question is then, given, given these this three steps prior, given that we have a point estimator with optimal properties, then how do, we make, how do we make inferences about the true parameter? And I want to discuss that a little bit more because it turns out that the bandwidth uh, that leads to an optimal point estimator creates some problems for inference that, if ignored, can lead to uh, invalid inferences. Okay, so the first thing to note is that P is, um, is the order of the polynomial is just um, the, the intention of the polynomial is just to approximate the unknown function. Um, and so we, you know, the higher the order, the more flexible the approximation, but the approximation is going to be local and that's going to be controlled by the bandwidth. And so what we want is to keep a polynomial of low order to avoid overfitting. And what I want to show you, the practice is to really choose a polynomial of order one. And what I want to show you is that, you know, Given the polynomial order that we have chosen, we can always make the approximation better by shrinking, decreasing the bandwidth. So here what you're seeing is some nonlinear uh, regression functions under treatment and under control. And I'm using, uh, I'm using a local linear approximation. So I have chosen a polynomial of order one. So you can see within the bandwidth H2, this linear approximation is it's not very good. Uh, the estimated intercept that this would give me is quite different from the actual intercept, right? But keeping the order of the polynomial constant fixed, so still uh, looking at local linear approximations, I can improve this approximation by shrinking, making the bandwidth smaller. So within H1, which is a much smaller bandwidth than H2, the same linear approximation is now much, much better. So this is the principle why uh, we first choose the order of the polynomial, and then we choose a bandwidth optimally that's going to minimize, for example, the mean square error, asymptotic mean square error of the point estimator. So if we do that, um, the bandwidth is going, to, is going to incorporate the order of the polynomial. So if we choose a polynomial order that is low, the bandwidth will consequently shrink enough until the approximation is considered to be acceptable. So it's not really a restriction. Um, to fix p equal to 1 because we have the bandwidth choice that's going to adapt to the order of the polynomial. So how do we choose the bandwidth? Just a few words about this. So uh, once, we, once p has been chosen, so once we have decided the order of the polynomial, which is typically p equal to 1, we typically choose the bandwidth, usually we call it h, to ensure that the point estimator has good properties. Um, it is very standard to uh, choose uh, the, uh, the mean square, what we call the mean square or optimal bandwidth. So what this bandwidth is, is it is the bandwidth that minimizes an approximation to the asymptotic uh, mean square error of the point estimator. Um, the bandwidth has this, this form, the optimal bandwidth. Um, and what you can see is, well, it depends on the sample size, which is n in this case, and it, and it also depends on the variance and the bias of, of the point estimator. And so the key idea intuitively is that uh, if the bias, the, uh, the curvature, so go back to this, to this, to this plot, 
If the curvature is very uh, extreme, the bandwidth is going to take to shrink, get smaller, to decrease the bias, to control the bias. Um, and if the variance, and so basically when the bias is large, the bandwidth will tend to be smaller. So a smaller bandwidth leads to smaller bias. Um, but when the variance, you know, obviously the, there's a trade-off because when you decrease the bandwidth, you are also losing observations. And when you lose observations, the variance increases. And so the, the bandwidth is chosen to balance these two concerns, the concern that the bias should be minimized and therefore the bandwidth should be made as small as possible to make that approximation very good. But at some point we have to, but we also have to balance the concern of bias with the concern of variance because obviously if we keep shrinking the bandwidth and we shrink it too much, we're going to run out of observations and so the variance of our estimator is going to be too high. Okay. Uh, and so the, the bandwidth, the optimal, the mean square optimal bandwidth is going to balance these two concerns. And that's how we're going to choose it. Um, the kernel function can be chosen, for example, in this context, kernel, uh, the triangular kernel is going to be the optimal kernel to use and it's typically chosen, it can be chosen to achieve uh, optimality properties of the point estimator, um, but it's not seen as such a crucial choice. So this is what local uh, polynomial estimation looks like. Um, the RD effect is basically, so basically we just do, if you think about what we're doing when we choose B equal to one, is we choose a bandwidth within that bandwidth, which is fit to least squares regressions, you know, just a linear uh, regression to the right and a linear to the right to the left, and we just um, take the difference between the point estimators. And so, when when we choose the bandwidth in an optimal way, and we have a mean square optimal bandwidth, then the point estimator is also optimal. Um, so, what is the temptation once we have done this to make inferences? Well, we know that we have run two least squares regressions, weighted least squares regressions if we've used a kernel on either side. Uh, and so we can construct the usual uh, T statistic, which is point estimator over variance, and we can use the OLS variance. So that's what we conventional inference would do. Uh, and just use we can just use an asymptote, a normal uh, approximation. Uh, to the distribution of our of our test statistic and, and just build confidence intervals as you would normally build it, point estimator plus or minus y96, the standard error, and we can basically use OLS uh, large sample properties to do this. Uh, so that would be, you know, this is this is what a lot of people do. This is it's it's natural to do because it, because OLS on either side of the cutoff is exactly what we've done. Now what is the thing? What is the issue? Well, the issue is that this assumption, this this procedure of using just you know no, uh, all or less uh, 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 distribution in in, in asymptotic uh, approximations, assumes that what we have done uh, is a parametric estimation. So what what this conventional inference procedure assumes is that we know what the what the function of form is. We are committed to the function of form being exactly linear if we chose p equal to one. But in reality, this procedure is non-parametric. When we fit a polynomial, we, we are not committed to that polynomial being the right functional form. All we're doing is trying to approximate the functional form that we don't know. So one can show that the distributional approximation of the usual test statistic, point estimator, the, the RD point estimator over the variance, it is, uh, it is a normal distribution, but it has a bias. It has a bias. And what is the bias? coming from? Well, the bias reflects the curvature of the regression function. So the bias reflects the fact that if I choose p equal to 1 within a bandwidth, that linear approximation is going to be an approximation and is going to have some approximation error. There's going to be some error in those plots. You saw that the intercept that I estimate when I fit a linear function it's not going to be exactly the, you know, what the true intercept is. It's going to be close. But that error is what the bias is capturing. The error is going to be zero when, within the bandwidth, the order of the polynomial that you have chosen is exactly the function of form. And in particular, this bias appears in the distribution approximation when you choose the mean square or optimal bandwidth. And so the conventional approach of just taking um, 
your point estimator, your RD point estimator, and using, you know, the OLS, you know, standard errors in a, a normal approximation and constructed confidence intervals based on that, um, ignores the bias and so leads to confidence intervals that don't have correct coverage. Uh, so, the, so the inferences that you make are invalid uh, if the bias is not negligible. You could shrink the bandwidth, do some undersmoothing to avoid this, but it's not clear how you would do this. And what we, the spirit of, you know, a robust procedures is to provide um, inferences that are valid without having to uh, change the, the mean square or optimal bandwidth or some other kind of optimal bandwidth. So one approach would be and uh, is to remo estimate the bias. So this, this B term is unknown, but it depends on quantities that can be estimated. So one approach is to um, estimate this bias because um, the, now the test statistic, the, what we call the bias corrective statistic, where we remove the bias, so it's the point estimator minus the bias over the conventional uh, uh, variance standard error, that, uh, that now has a, a, a normal uh, a normal uh, uh, asymptotic distribution center at zero. So one could estimate that bias. Um, the bias depends on the higher uh, or the derivatives of of the regression functions because it captures the curvature of them. So one could adjust the point estimator by the estimated bias and then construct the confidence intervals appropriately using the same variance. So that's called the bias correction approach. And this approach um, Although it does lead in large samples to correct inferences because we have removed the bias uh, uh, from, from the approximation, it has very poor finite sample properties. The reason is because the very, we introduce variability by estimating the bias, uh, and that variability that we introduce by estimating the bias is not incorporated, is not reflected in the variance estimator that we're using. Okay, so the robust approach that, uh, that we take uh, it's built on the observation that that term, the bias term, is, con uh, it is, is there to estimate, you know, the leading bias. So the usual bias correction approach with that, with that uh, what happens is we construct an estimator uh, and we assume that this second portion uh, uh, of, the, of the test statistic converges in probability to zero, so it doesn't contribute to, to the asymptotic variance. Uh, the, the, the robust confidence intervals that we develop are built on a, on a non-standard asymptotics idea in which instead of letting this term uh, go in probability to zero, what we do is uh, the alternative asymptotic theory lets this term uh, converge in distribution as opposed to in probability. So it converges to, uh, to a non-degenerate degenerate random variable and now this random variable has a variance, asymptotic variance, and what and what we and then what happens is that this we the this alternative asymptotics lead to uh, a t statistic, which we call the RBC, so the robust bias corrective statistic, that has uh, it's the point estimator minus the bias to correct for the bias, but it also has an, a new a different variance in the denominator, and the variance is higher than the previous variance. So the VN here, that's the variance that you get from the standard OLS procedure, uh, uh, conventional. Uh, and this WN is an additional term that captures the variability that we have introduced by estimating the bias. And, it also, and also the covariance between the estimated bias and the estimated point estimate. So what this leads to is to robust confidence intervals so that, are, uh, that are centered not at the point estimator, and I'll talk more about this, but at, they're centered at the bias corrected point estimator, and they use a variance estimator um, that incorporates the variability that we have introduced in the bias uh, correction step. This confidence intervals do have correct coverage, in part, you know, for a wider range of bandwidths, and in particular, they they are valid whenever uh, for the mean square or optimal bandwidth. Okay, so what I want to point out, um, and I'm I'm wrapping up. I'm going to show you uh, a few more slides and then uh, uh, a quick example. Uh, 
you know, the conventional procedure, you know, the uh, robust confidence intervals that we do, they highlight an important distinction between point estimation and inference. Uh, so we usually, the conventional procedure to derive confidence intervals is actually based on point estimators. So we typically derive the asymptotic normal distribution of some, you know, t-statistic, the point estimator minus, uh, you know, the value of the parameter over the standard error, and then we, and then we build confidence intervals based on the dual of that. So point estimator plus or minus, you know, y96 standard error. Um, the general idea that we're using here in the robust confidence intervals for RD is that we choose uh, a test statistic and obtain the asymptotic distribution, and we build confidence intervals as the collection of all hypotheses not rejected by it, um, but not but, but non necessarily excuse me, not necessarily as the dual, as the point estimator, as we do above. So the idea is that we choose an alternative, which we choose another test statistic, uh, and the point estimator of interest may or may not exist, but need not, need not, does not need to be at the center of this confidence interval. So if you look, um, Robust uh, a robust confidence intervals. We we took uh, we take an alternative test test statistic. It's not the point estimator over the standard error. It's the bias corrected estimator over a different uh, be, um, standard error estimator. And we build the confidence intervals based on this alternative statistic. You can look at the statistic and see that this statistic is not centered at the point estimator uh, tau hat, which is the RD effect. It's, it's centered at the bias corrected estimator, and it's also rescaled to reflect the variability that we've introduced in the correction. So I'll just show you very briefly an illustration. Um, this is um, an incumbency advantage example that comes from the U.S. Senate. The score in this application is the Democratic vote share uh, for a Senate uh, for a Senate election, uh, and the. This is the margin of victory of the Democratic Party. At zero, the Democratic Party wins because the uh, margin of victory is positive. Uh, below zero, it loses. And so the, the outcome variable is the, the vote share that the Democratic Party gets in the following Senate election for the same seat. And so what I'm showing you here is just uh, using this estimation procedure uh, in R with the RD robust routine. So we have Y, which is the vote share of the Democratic Party uh, in the following election. X is the margin of victory of the Democratic Party. The cutoff is zero. P is the order of the polynomial approximation. Uh, so I'm showing you the output here. So the overall output shows you a lot of things. So the number of observations that are originally used. Uh, this is the bandwidth excuse me, this is the bandwidth uh, that is chosen, so 17 points, so 17 percentage points, and how many effective observations we have on either side. But I want to focus here on, on what happens on, on, on the output of the, of the estimation. What we see is the conventional point estimate, so the only point estimate that is by default reported is the, the, the uh, conventional point estimator in RD, which is 7.4 percentage points. So this means that the Democratic Party, when the Democratic Party barely wins a Senate election, uh, in the following election for that same seat gets a, a boost of seven, 7 percentage points. And so what we see here is two uh, standard error, two confidence intervals reported. The one that I have in the box to the right, to the bottom right, uh, that's the robust confidence intervals. And I want to point out, uh, I did some calculations for you on the bottom so you could see the connection between those concepts and, you know, and practice. Uh, the conventional confidence interval has shorter length than the robust confidence intervals because I showed you the robust confidence interval has higher variance. So, so the length is going, all, all, only going, uh, all, always going to be smaller for the conventional confidence intervals. Uh, obviously, the conventional confidence intervals don't have correct coverage. Uh, so, uh, so, so, uh, so that's why we that's why we have uh, the, the 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 higher length in the robust. So you can see the length here is about 5.8 for the conventional and and 6.9 for the robust. The other thing is the conventional confidence intervals, which are the 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 confidence intervals that are not boxed. Those are centered at the at the 7.423, which is the point estimator, but the um, but that's not the center of the robust standard of the robust confidence intervals. We want to see uh, how the robust confidence intervals are constructed. We can use the function all true, 
the the option and so what we can see here we report the point estimator uh, the conventional point estimator the bias corrected point estimators and 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 then the bias corrected point estimators with the robust confidence interval so I'm going to zoom here and so what you can see is you um, this is you know the recommendation then uh, that follows from this research is that we still need to report I mean it's still preferable that you report the coefficient the standard coefficient not the bias corrected one because that still has optimal properties so it's mean square or optimal um, uh, and it's also consistent obviously and so that's a point estimator that has very good properties um, but the confidence intervals that have correct coverage and also good final sample properties are the robust ones so you can see here that I you see the confidence intervals the first two so the first confidence interval is centered at the point at the conventional point estimator the second two confidence intervals are centered at the bias corrected point estimator and the third one which is the robust confidence intervals is centered at the bias corrected point estimator and it's also using the different variants so if you see here the way we construct the robust confidence intervals is bias corrected point estimator, which is 7.5265, so this here on the bottom, plus or minus Y96, which is the normal quantile, times the robust variance estimator, which is here. So you can see both the conventional and the bias corrected procedures, they use the conventional variance estimator. That's why you see the same standard error in the two. But these robust procedures, they use a different variance estimator that incorporates the variability of the bias correction step. Okay. So I wanted to show you in practice this thing. So I want to leave some uh, time for questions. Uh, what robust confidence intervals then do is they let they let you, researcher, choose a, uh, a bandwidth so that your point estimator has optimal properties, and then and then base uh, make inferences using that bandwidth that are also valid. Uh, which wouldn't be the case if you did conventional inference. Uh, and so in in thinking about this this issues, you can see that uh, are the robust uh, these robust confidence intervals require you to think uh, hard about the distinction between point estimation and confidence intervals. Uh, and I have in there some uh, some some uh, links to our our the software page in in places where you, you know you can get more information and and, and more information about software and how to implement these things. And I'll, Justin, I'll let you say. Okay, uh, thanks for that presentation. Uh, at this point, uh, Rocio is available to take questions from the audience. Uh, you can call in to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call-in line, 1-855-982-9766. You may email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. For our viewers outside the U.S., we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure we receive your questions immediately. We've already received uh, a number of questions, so I just want to get right to it. All right. Um, uh, from uh, Thomas Ball, and this is something I wondered about too. Uh, so you talk about um, having an estimated bias term that you're using to construct confidence intervals, mm -hmm. but uh, that depends on knowing the, the actual underlying function, right? You can't know the bias unless you know the true function, so you have to be estimating that bias without knowing the true function. So how are you doing that? Yeah, excellent question. Um, yeah, that is correct. You the So the bias is not known, but the, um, but the bias is coming from the fact that um, we approximate, for example, we are, we are approximate, if we choose to approximate with a polynomial of order one, the bias is coming from the fact that we have ignored the higher order, the higher order terms in that approximation, right? So we estimated, if we do a local linear polynomial, we have uh, a, 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 a term of order zero and then a term of order one. And then we, we didn't estimate the square, the cube, the fourth order and so on and so if we kept going we know right that the Taylor approximation could be exact if we kept going if we kept increasing the order of the approximation so the bias is coming from having stopped at some point instead of continuing with the other uh, with with the higher uh, orders of the polynomial so the, obviously the bias is unknown because the function is unknown but but what 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 you do is that the leading bias 
uh, is the 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 first order of the, po the the biases of the order of the polynomial that you've um, so for example if you use a linear uh, polynomial p equal to one then the bias uh, the leading bias is going to be the difference in the second derivatives of the functions on either side because uh, because that's basically that's that's the first order, that's the error of the first order that you made. When you assume that it's linear, then the following, the following term is, is going to be the order of the leading bias. So what you do is basically you use local polynomial estimation again, because you, you can use local polynomial estimation to estimate any derivative and the derivative of any order for an unknown function. And so what you do is you use local polynomial to estimate uh, the second derivative of the function as opposed to the first. And what that requires is uh, another choice of bandwidth, which is the B that you saw in the output here. Uh, here you see uh, a B. So that B is coming because to estimate the bias, you need to fit another local polynomial, you, you need to fit uh, an estimate, uh, a local polynomial estimator to get at the higher order derivatives of the function. So you do local polynomial estimate, you estimate them with local polynomial again. So it's not, you don't assume that you know it, but you approximate it. And what you do is you estimate the leading bias. So you still make, you still make an error in that bias in that you ignore all the higher order terms, but you know that the, the large sample properties are going to be dictated by, by, the, by the order of that. So am, I, am I understanding you correctly that you estimate like a second order local linear regression or kernel mm -hmm. regression? Mm -hmm. And use the difference between the first and second order estimations uh, no, what, you, what you do is so for example if you do a local linear then the bias is going to be the difference in the second derivatives to the right and to the left so basically if you look at the plot let me see so uh, say here if you use a linear you could make an error and then the bias could be uh, the the bias could be the difference between the second derivative of the function uh, on either side. Right, it's going to be proportional to the curvature of the function, but how, That's do, you, right. how do you know the function? <laughs> That's the, are you no, estimating you know, second order? You know, you approximate it. You estimate it, we, you approximate it, you don't know it. So you, you, you approximate it, just how you approximate it. So this function, you don't know, still you approximate this difference. In the mm -hmm. same way, you approximate the difference in the derivatives of this function. And you're approximating that by using the, by estimating a second kernel regression with a higher order uh, function assumed? With with a higher order, with a polynomial of higher order. Right. So that's that, right. that sort of leads to the, the next question, which is, well, okay, why not just use that second order or third order or fourth order polynomial as part of your original uh, original estimate? You could. You could always, so given the bandwidth, you could always increase the order of a polynomial and make that approximation better. Uh, you would never know how to stop, right? So, given the bandwidth, you can you could you can always go cube or or fifth, but you would you would have severe problems of overfitting if you kept going, right? I you know my um, experience with non-parametric um, estimators is that sometimes it it can be better to use a zeroth order, uh, not a Raya Watson type estimator, with a fairly narrow bandwidth if the function is very um, curvy. In essence, if there's a lot of local variation and if you try to over, if you try to impose a, a first order or a second order um, uh, function on top of that data, what you'll get is, is effect, in effect over smoothing. Um, yeah, so um, I'm wondering how you trade those two things off. Well, you, you can show that for a boundary point using a polynomial of order zero, it doesn't, doesn't have good behavior. Yeah, so, the so, edges. So, yeah. So using the linear, so using the the linear or higher is preferable. the The idea is that you want to keep the order of the polynomial. Um, the idea is to remember then that the bandwidth adapts to how the to the order of the polynomial that you've chosen. So if you tell me that you want to choose a polynomial of order six, then and then you choose a an optimal bandwidth, the optim your optimal bandwidth is going to be smaller and smaller the higher the order of the polynomial that you choose because you first choose P, then you choose the bandwidth. 
Um, and so because the bandwidth is going to adapt to your choice of P, you can keep P low, and so the, the, but, but higher than zero because, so that you don't run into the boundary problems. So and you, you keep P low uh, and then let your bandwidth, if there are enough observations, your, your bandwidth is going to get small enough until that approximation is, is good enough. And that can always happen, right? So given P, I can always shrink bandwidth as much as I want. Obviously, the restriction there is going to be your number of observations. You know, I was thinking about the, the edge behavior, which you're absolutely right. The, the, the zeroth orders tend to break down at the edges. But if you assumed you know, the, a discontinuity is always in the middle of the data. And I think if you assumed that the, at, the, at the point of discontinuity, the slope was the same, you might be able to take advantage of that assumption to get a, a sort of a, a better estimate, which is a relatively minor assumption to make. I mean, it, it's, it's an assumption you have to assume that you can't, you know, it, do, it, it means something. You're adding information to the data in that way. But it, it you might, mean a slope on either side? Yeah, so in other words, if you assume, if all you assume is that at the discontinuity the slopes are equal, that yeah. would enable you to essentially treat the estimation as though there's not an edge there. Because, of course, the problem is that an edge, there's no data on the other side, so you don't know. Right. No, I mean, the, we try to avoid that assumption, and perhaps the reason, you know, if, the, if you adopt the potential outcomes framework and you look at this plot, the way we think about these functions is this is not the same function. These are two completely separate functions, right? So the regression, the potential outcome under treatment is one function, the potential outcome under control is another function, and there is no reason why they should have the same sh shape or form. Um, and so to impose, I mean, you could impose some parametric, you know, restrictions on, and and you would, and your, you know, that information will always be valuable for estimation and inference if you're willing to believe it. I think the um, the whole approach to RD estimation and inference has a very non-parametric flavor because of, you know, I guess because of the potential outcomes framework, which is a very non-parametric framework, and because we think that these two regression functions need not be equal at all. Right, so your response on the treatment might be completely different than your response on the control in very general ways. Uh, there's point? another uh, question from the audience from uh, Francesca Jensenius. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for a great talk. Would it be appropriate to use these robust CIs for binary outcome variables as well, and would it be appropriate to use them for data with clustering, for example, regional clustering in the observations? Yeah, so the binary outcome variable uh, poses no problem at no point in the procedure or identification or inference um, or estimation assumptions do we need uh, for for the outcome to uh, to not be binary. So so that's fine. Um, the um, the clustering, um, you know, funny you mentioned that. So we are working on uh, a project that incorporates. Uh, clustering and covariate to the estimation, which is something that people want to do uh, in their applied work, and they're usually required by reviewers to do, uh, in, and it's a very common practice. Um, right now, our procedure doesn't allow for, um, for, for, in, for clustering their standard errors, but we um, but we are the right, but but you're we we're generalizing this procedure to, to doing so to to basically incorporating clustering and covariates. Um, the thing to um, uh, to note is that you know because identification happens at a point and really the parameter is just the average treatment effect at a particular point. Uh, in samples, the clustering or the covariates, all that is not going to make really. Uh, you know, it's not going to make a difference, but it can make a difference for the final type of properties of, 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 of the procedure. Um, so we can't, you can't do it now with robust yet. I mean, I think right now, before you have developed this sort of application, right now the trade-off would be what's more important, getting the functional form right at the discontinuity where you're going to employ pair non parametric methods yeah. or accounting for this clustering, which you can always do linear regression with the discontinuity and then correct for... Yeah, but the thing with the clustering is that in large samples, the clustering will not occur, the right? Because at the cutoff, there will be no clustering. Everyone has the same value of the covariate. Hmm. So you can always rely on kind of large sample intuitions and say, you know, clustering cannot make a difference in large samples. It's just if the small samples might, uh, might you know, might make a difference. It's like trying to include, um, you know, binary covariates for, like, fixed effects. You know, you know that, you know, uh, 
in large samples, the fixed effects, are, you know, are not are not going to are not going to matter. If you assume continuity of these regression functions, then what you're saying is that you know these characteristics of the units are going to be uh, smoothly, you know, they're going to be continuous on either side. But it but sometimes the finer properties of uh, of this. Um, of these procedures actually can improve if you incorporate those things because before you get to an infinity <laughs> you you know there might be clustering and there might be a way to say reduce the variability uh, of your point estimator of your estimators by incorporating covariates on these kinds of things. Uh, we have time for one last question from Brad Jones. Uh, the discussion here is applicable to sharp RD designs. Uh, could you speculate a bit about how your approach or way of thinking would apply to fuzzy regression discontinuity? Yeah, so I don't have to speculate. I can tell you that uh, that we've done we've done it for fuzzy as well, and so every all the all the machinery and the robust confidence intervals apply. Uh, apply to fuzzy too. They take a different uh, form because now the point estimator is now a uh, the point estimator is now a ratio of the two intention to treat effects, so the effect on of the assignment on the outcome and on the assignment on the on the treatment take up. And so uh, you have to um, so the, the formulas do change because the point estimator changes, but the procedure of how to derive the robust confidence intervals does not, which is we build the alternative T statistic, uh, which is bias corrected, uh, and and have the adi the additional term for the additional variability and build confidence robust confidence intervals for them, and we have them implemented. So so the theory for that already exists. We actually have time for one more, so I'll, I'll give another yeah. question from uh, Thomas Ball, who I see just left the audience. That's too bad. Uh, is it, uh, but, but I think this is a good question to ask anyway, just for the general audience. Is it yeah. useful to um, uh, have a test or a holdout sample um, as a validation step? I know that in non-parametric regression, you can, for example, use generalized cross-validation as a as a, a uh, what do you call it? A shortcut to instead of doing true cross validation, but is true cross validation going to improve your results in any way? Um, are we talking? I mean, we you could use cross validation to choose the bandwidth, and there are some procedures. So I had it in my slides, then I deleted it because a lot of people, uh, you know, most people now use plug-in methods. So the method that I discussed to to estimate the bandwidth is is, is plug-in. So basically, we derive the actual formula for the optimal. Uh, bandwidth, and then we we plug in, uh, we estimate the component of that formula, and that's our estimated bandwidth. Another alternative would be to use cross validation methods to get uh, to estimate this bandwidth. Uh, and you know, Ludwig and Miller did it in a paper, and so there are there are there are procedures to do that, and and you could, you could, yes. All right. Well, we're right at noon. So um, uh, first, I want to uh, thank Rocio for uh, for appearing today. Thank you very much. I think you gave a great talk, and I am actually just as a personal note, I really thought you clearly communicated what you were talking about very well. I'm sure your students are very appreciative of your uh, uh, clear communication. Um, thank. Uh, I appreciate that. It's very hard to know if you're communicating anything with you when you don't see anyone's faces. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're just talking to your computer. But uh, yeah, but I did a great job. <laughs> Uh, next Friday, February 26th at noon Eastern, we're going to have a talk from Justin Grimmer of Stanford. Uh, the talk will be entitled The Unreliability of Measures of Intercoder Reliability and What to Do About It. Yeah, there's a paper uh, uh, uploaded to our website, methods-colloquium.com, and you can go there to register for the talk, see the paper, and get more details. Uh, thank you, Rocio. Uh, thanks to everyone who came today, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Justin. Thank you all.